This is a review, as you'll see, of Tom Thatcher's Johanny Epistle's commentary. Uh, the Expositor's Bible Commentary has earned the reputation for being a very helpful commentary series for all who desire to engage in serious study of the scriptures. The aim of the EBC is not to rival the multi-volume commentary sets that have sometimes been produced in the books of the Bible. Instead, each work within the EBC aims at and succeeds in being a comprehensive yet succinct commentary to guide one to the gist of the text meaning. <coughs> and the commentary on 2nd 3rd John by Tom Thatcher in a revised edition is no exception. Thatcher completed his doctoral study at the, study at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and is an associate pastor, uh, associate professor of New Testament at Cincinnati Christian University in Ohio. Besides his work in the EBC for the Johannine Epistles, he has also written other works primarily focused on the Gospel of John. The commentary on the Johannine Epistles is discussed by each letter, but the introductory material for all three epistles, except for the outlines of 2nd and 3rd John, is treated together in the introduction of 1st John. The introduction includes opening comments, a discussion of authorship, historical setting, structure, summary, bibliography, and an outline of 1st John. The discussion on authorship and historical setting demonstrates Thatcher's familiarity with the scholarly discussion surrounding 1st John. Those of a more conservative persuasion, such as this reviewer, will regret Thatcher's conclusion on authorship that, quote, combines elements of the traditional view and the school approach, end quote, meaning that he does not believe the Johannine epistles were written by the Apostle John himself, but by the teachers who adhere to the teaching of a particular individual who may or may not have been the Apostle John. His discussion on the historical setting of the Johannine literature was very helpful in explaining the outline of 1 John. Thatcher insightfully identifies John's dualism that, quote, rigorously discriminates between truth and falsehood, quote, pitting the children of God against the world or against the Antichrist. Many find 1 John difficult to outline because the argument can appear, can appear cyclical or repetitive rather than logical and linear. But by following John's dualistic use of the, of the world and the Antichrist, Thatcher gives a helpful outline. He proposes that um, chapter 1, 1 to 4 serves as a prologue which establishes the boundaries of orthodoxy. And chapter 1, verse 5 to 2, 17 puts forth four tests to distinguish tests. To distinguish true disciples that's from the world. That's why you got a D. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and chapter 2, verse 18 of 521 adds six more tests to distinguish true disciples from Antichrist. The format of the commentary on the actual text is generally to begin with an overview of the section, as indicated by the outline, followed by the text of the section in the NIV, and then verse by verse commentary. Occasionally, the commentary is followed by additional notes that give greater detail on some doctrinal, lexical, or grammatical issues. And sometimes after the notes, there's also further reflection on the answer. This format is actually very helpful in concisely but usefully explaining the text. While some commentaries may get carried away on irrelevant details and rabbit trails, the overview at the start of each section helps to give the big picture so that the reader understands the main thrust of the section before diving into the detailed explanation. This helps the reader to not miss the forest for the trees. While the NIV is an acceptable translation of scripture, this review regrets that the author's own translations were not included in its place. The NIV translation of the Bible is already easily accessible to all, so if anyone was curious as to how the NIV rendered the passage, that could easily be found. The actual commentary on the text is very well suited to its target audience, which covers a broad range of individuals, from the lay student of scripture to the seminary trained scholar. Certainly there are some terms and discussions that would require considerable effort and attention for a lay student to comprehend. Conversely, in some places, this commentary would undoubtedly be lacking or too simple for the advanced scholar. But if one were trying to produce a commentary that could decently serve both individuals on either end of the spectrum and do so concisely, Thatcher's work on the Ohanan epistles in the EBC is superb. This section also uh, includes discussion of Greek words and transliterated, transliterated English and references, references to other resources for further study. Those of a more scholarly disposition or those who desire to study an issue with further depth will desire to look for the notes section that occasionally follows the commentary. Here, the author interacts with more complex issues and includes the Greek words, though English transliteration is still provided as well. Thatcher often provides resources for further study on certain issues here as well. By taking, sep by taking separating, by separating the more complex material 
uh, out of the general commentary section, the lay student will be able to benefit from the commentary without being overwhelmed or discouraged. Yet more advanced students can still interact on a deeper level occasionally as well. Thus, one of the strengths of the EBC, its depth of scholarship while still being accessible, is the result largely of how the commentary is formatted. Having said that, however, this reviewer was surprised to find that the commentary for second and third John deviated from the expected format by omitting the brief overview at the start of some sections. Furthermore, this commentary could have been improved if there were more suggested applications. After all, one of the difficulties in understanding 1 John is working through the absolute dualistic manner in which John wrote. John said everything is right or wrong, black or white, and there was no shades of gray between. But how does one preach, explain, or apply such truths to imperfect, sinful believers? While that omission is indeed a weakness, Patrick's work on the Johanna Epistle will certainly be helpful to a broad range of students. Its simplicity and brevity will make it accessible to everyone, and the deeper discussion in the notes will please the more advanced students of scripture as well, though it will likely not be enough to completely satisfy their curiosity. Even still, this is a fine commentary on the Johanna Epistles that perfectly fits the aim of the Expositor's Bible Commentary Series. Any questions? Especially anybody else. Who else did Thatcher? Thanks. Anything you would add from your reading of Thatcher? No, I, mean, I mean, probably the biggest thing that stood out to me was this continuous kind of, um, he, uh, he would take parts of both you know, opposing views. So with this school, this school thought of the authorship, or um, thinking in 2.2 or 2.20, um, different points he would take, he would combine the approach. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and uh, you can call that integrative, and you can call it syncretistic. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's 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 something we all wrestle with. I mean, you go to grad school, and hopefully, you know, you learn things sometimes from people you don't agree with on other fronts. Like, there's a lot to learn in Judith Liu's commentary, um, but you don't want to compromise, you know, your your own systematic understanding. I mean, you want that understanding to to grow and and to improve and so forth. But there's a point at which there are elements banging at the door and you can't let them in. I mean, I don't know how you integrate Johannine authorship and school authorship. I don't think you can integrate that. And uh, the more serious you take the language of witness in John, and the more serious you take what we were talking about before the break, you know, the reality of God. And, th you know, these are very elusive things. And the only reason I think we could possibly have the integrity, or as they say in sports, the stones to talk about these things, is because somebody like John went through it. I mean, this is not a school, a speculative school somewhere, that's polemicizing and grasping concepts out of the air to try to defeat op opponents. You know, Jesus actually came and he actually instilled this, and this is a living reality that's been in the world to this day. And that's a very different understanding than these kind of shuffling these academic categories and concretizing speculative communities and coming up with, you know, with, with different, you know, constructs, rhetorical constructs and social situations, and you know, writing about them in a very impersonal, sort of removed way which is what happens when you start combining a bunch of methodologies and findings and you don't, you're not riveted. I mean, the writer of John's riveted by something. And, you know, either it's kind of delusional and maybe even a little haughty and self-important and he, maybe he's even kind of the bad guy and Diotrephes is kind of the good guy because he's standing up to this bully, you know, who talks down to everybody like, He's the only one that knows the truth. I mean, that's how a lot of the modern commentators treat Johannine epistles. You know, the heroes are the secessionists, and the evil people are the, or the orthodox community that's kicked him out. It's all upside down. Yeah? One thing that I did 
know this is, um, he was really emphatic about the historical setting of the combined school approach, and that really influenced how he would take even grammatical issues. He referred a lot to community slogans, and that would impact how he would take hobbies as a direct discourse marker a lot, more than you know, any of the other uses he would say, this is a slogan, and would break it off. Um, and so it seemed to be cut, not necessarily coming from the text, but more from his understanding of the historical setting. And he would say, this is a direct discourse, and throw me, and he'd pop in, and this is a community of common sayings within that community. Yeah, that's, that's the effect of, of, of the method. So, you know, one thing that um, I've noticed about a lot of your reviews is you, you tend to be very positive about the book you're reviewing. And uh, uh, I even say in my directions how to review a book, you know, I, I caution you about being gratuitously critical. So, I, I, you know, I, I, I want to commend you. It's better to err on the side of generosity and charity, you know, than it is to be a curmudgeon. And especially when you're a student, I mean, it's, it's fitting for us to be humble as students when we review published works. We probably haven't published many of them ourselves. You know, ha having said that, uh, if, if in your heart of hearts sometimes you wonder, do I really think this is a good thing? That's probably not a bad thing. You know, harbor, the, like Mary, harbor those things in your heart. And maybe by the time you're a senior, or maybe in your next degree, maybe you'll be writing more more balanced reviews, you know, where you confidently affirm something good. But a lot of your reviews, I'm, I'm waiting for the worm to turn. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for you to nail the person. And I mean, I don't want you to be hateful and narrow, you know, and, and gratuitously dismissive. But uh, there are a lot of things you could have said and maybe should have said that you didn't say. And that's good at this stage. And you said it well. And you know that I don't I don't give good grades to papers because you know, I agree with everything on them. I, I, I basically give good grades because they say defensible things in excellent ways. You know, literarily, you know, it's it's a, it's an easy read because I'm not struggling with spelling and commas and stuff like that. That that helps a lot. So thank you uh, for your uh, reading of Thatcher. Yeah, well, give him a hand. <laughs> Golden rule. And we're going to hear from one other reader today, but first we have to finish the section that we were working on. And when we finish that section, I think we, we have three more verses or two? Two. Two, two more verses, then we'll take our 15-minute break and get back on schedule. Uh, verse 14, chapter 2, uh, 5, 3, 2, 10, 5, one, two, five, three, two, ten, five, one, nine, two, five, three, two, ten, four, five, ten, one, two, one, two, nine, three, five, ten, five, one, four. Last word, Pane Ron. Brian Haskins, do you have any counsel for him? Uh, yeah, I think it also could be two as well. Okay, when you look up Pane Ross, you're going to find adjective. Where's Ryan? Wait, up, okay. Um, so that's going to that's your classic four dash two. So you really need both because it's not a noun. By itself, e uh, lexically it's not a noun; it's an adjective. But contextually, it becomes a noun. Any other numbers that somebody would like to improve on? Yeah. You mentioned before that that apa case could go instead of just a label and that's a nine and a two. It could be a three, three and a two. Three or a two. Yeah. Yeah. You could label apa case that prepositional phrase as either a three or a two taking the two words together. Okay.
cross reference is first John two twelve uh, is similar message I'm writing to you children and first John two thirteen is the a similar message too and Ephesians six ten uh, the word uh, strong is force is used and first John two twelve for the abide is used twice and first John 3 24 or so abides and John 5 38 <coughs> is word of Bible in you uh, is the same expression. Okay. And the uh, commentary uh, for grammar interaction. Uh, it is interesting that John uses aorist verbs rather than present verbs. Uh, Stott mentions that some commentators think that verse 14 is referred to a former letter or to the first part of the letter. Um, Stott's suggestion is an epistolary aorist referring to the present letter. Um, Letter in which case there is really do uh, difference in me uh, meaning between two tenses. I think he says there is no difference in meaning between two tenses. And Ryu thinks that this verse is urgent exhortation. And Stas seems like to think that word of God is the scriptures. Uh, he says Christian uh, revelation, uh, but Ryu uh, says more narrow. And he uh, she more narrows down to the gospel message. Okay. And final translation is I have written to you children because you know the father. I have written to you fathers because you know him who was from the beginning. And I have, I have written to you, young man, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have a good life in the evil one. John's emphasis on the confirmation of the Genuine believers in the section 2, 12, 14 gives us a good reminder that we have called by God to minister His people, encouraging them by the knowledge of whom they know and what He has done for them and what they can do by the perfect revelation of God. He forgave our sins. He is our Father. He was from the beginning and eternal God. He gives us His sufficient and authoritative revelation. Believers are his children. They are known by God from the beginning. They can conquer the evil one by the word of God. John writes a similar message repeatedly in this section. He wants them to be confident in their fellowship with God. Pastors also need to encourage people to rejoice in the relationship with God by confirming their spiritual reality and blessing them. And so, so in that, um, I mean, I, I think that insight is, uh, it's almost a paraphrase of the translation in some ways. Um, all these things are being affirmed by John. You know, he, he's, he is modeling the pastoral mission to his readers because he's he's testifying to the realities of the finished work of Christ in the people of God and think about the millions of people since the first century that uh, have been renewed by these words of John you know by these few verses but that's what we do as pastors, you know, symbolically week after week after week. It's not so much that, you know, we see big breakthroughs so that we can always mark progress in quantitative ways, although generally growth comes with good work done 
uh, in good ways. But, um, you know, pastors are, are symbols of stability for people. You know, kids are three, kids are five, kids are nine, kids are 12. It might be when they're 15 that it finally hits them. <laughs> but you, you keep rehearsing these truths in the structure, you know, that has evolved in various, various churches have different ways of sort of going through the year and glorifying Christ as a congregation, you know, and through preaching and through song and prayer and service and all the things you do. And um, you can look back and, and you can say these things. People know God, they're strong, the word of God abides in them. And uh, John was an instrument in that because that, that's what he stood for and that's what he urged, that's what he proclaimed, that's what he taught, that's what he modeled. And uh, it happens. You know, it happens through the quiet means of the testimony of somebody like John. And, you know, you are and I am, uh, we're an extension of that. So this, this, is, this is very non-dramatic, but um, it's like Jesus saying, you know, the kingdom of God is like the farmer who sows his field and then he goes to bed. And it grows, and he doesn't know how. <laughs> and then it's time for harvest. It's all, it's all pretty inexplicable. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Josh. And uh, Pastor, you're saying pastors are symbols of truth? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I believe I believe in um, I believe in the low church mission, and I believe in the um, the tendency of state churches and of high historic liturgical churches to to uh, encourage formality and dead ritual. But but having said that. Those of us who are who are Baptistic and free church and independent. Uh, we slit our own throats sometimes. Yeah, how come we've seen so many pastors fall? Well, that's, you know, you have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. But what I want to say is pastors are more important than a lot of Baptist churches or Baptistic churches want them to be. Because we live in the United States, and politically... I'm not talking about Democrat and Republican. I'm just talking as a polis, as people in North America. You know, we want our leaders to serve us and to make things good for us. That's what we expect. And uh, pastors are father figures. Boy, and that's... You say that in church, that's going to hit the fan a lot of places now, too. So what did you say there? They're father figures. Oh, father figures. And a father figure emphatically doesn't always give the kids what they demand. <laughs> you know, you find yourself as a parent sometimes, you're in a, a, a long-term struggle with this or that kid in this or that aspect of their life. And that's the way pastoring is. And so on the one hand, we have to serve the people. On the other hand, we have to serve the Lord. And you can't, it's, it's, it's like this thing with, with uh, commentaries that want to take from everybody. You can't, ple you can't please everybody. And uh, my point is that pastors are very important symbolically in the church. They stand for something. And I don't want to say they stand for God, you know, period. But more than anybody else in the congregation, they are charged as under shepherds of the great shepherd. The pastor is the most direct link to God in Christ of anybody in the church. And you know, you just go through those, you know the Bible. Obey your leaders. 
it says in Hebrews 13, as those who will give an account for your souls. You're going to give an account as a pastor for the souls of your people. So don't, you know, don't let them, don't let them just, you know, make it all into an egalitarian free-for-all where you just kind of wait for them to vote to tell you what you can do. <laughs> and if that's the model you've inherited, you know, you, you got to start chipping away at, at restoring God's order to his people. You know, God has delegated his authority into structures. And I, you know, I don't think we have to decide here between congregational polity or uh, Presbyterian polity or, or some perm. I mean, there are a lot of our polities that I think, you know, Christ can be head. But Christ can't be head with no pastor in the church. Or when everything the pastor does is just consensus of the masses. So, um, this is not exactly what John's talking about, but I do think it's related. Um, and what I'm trying to do is, uh, I'm trying to, 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 to glorify the mediation of these truths to God's people in ways that uh, revolutionizes life for them. That's the pastor's task. And uh, the main way we do it is by testifying consistently and faithfully to God. And God, you know, people brush up against God through our service to God and our service of the word of God and our representation of God in our actions and in our teaching and in our preaching, in our, in our hospital visitation, in our prayers. You know, we make God real to people because he is real to us. And, you know, people, we're not going to go away. <laughs> we're going to keep being pastors to, to the people that, that, that come to this church and, and, and beyond. And it's going to have an effect on them. John had an effect. Just to, to pause before the last verse, um, I actually found that uh, there's a whole lot to be said about these verses uh, that we've just gone through. And I probably was more surprised in my commentary about how much there was to say about these few verses, uh, 12, 13, 14, than any others. But when I got down to the change from the present to the uh, aorist, you'd have to read the commentary uh, to get the whole uh, sense. But if I could just run through here, uh, I observed above that in some respects, can you, can you read that more or less? I can go just a tad bigger. What page? This is uh, 121. In some respects, 2, 12, and 13 serves the purpose of a greeting. 1 John 2, 14 continues in this vein and follows in an identical syntactical pattern, yet there is an obvious change in the initial verb. And Josh was just, you know, commenting on what how Stott, he said it was synonymous, right? It may be granted that the shift from grapho in 2.12.13 to egrapsa in 2.14 marks stylistic preference rather than temporal reference. By egrapsa, John is not referring to something that he did in former times as opposed to what he is doing currently as reflected in the use of grapho. Egrapsa is simply an epistolary aorist. Temporally, there is no reason why the acts denoted by the respective verbs cannot be simultaneous. In other words, grapho, egrapsa, there is a certain synonymity there. Yet even Porter, who rejects any temporal differentiation in the morphological shift, sees a change in emphasis. In my view, which I reflect in my translation, the change may be explained as follows. The first person form of Grafo, more heavily marked than the aorist, according to Porter, is used to convey a relatively high degree of feeling and urgency, as indicated in the exegesis of 2, 12, and 13. My translation, the reason I am writing, attempts to express in English the gist of John's direct, personal, and emphatic tone. 
In contrast, the slightly de-emphasized Arist Egrov saw befits 2.14's restatement and slight elaboration of 2.12 and 13. Whereas Grafo comported with John's act of writing, Egrov saw views the fact of having written regarded in its entirety, not because of the individual semantic value of the Eris component, but because of the meaning of Egrop saw as an entire proposition in context, quoting Porter. So my translation, I have written in 2.14, seeks to reflect this understanding. It also, char also characterizes the second phase of John's extended de facto greeting as reflective, whereas 2.12 and 13 is reflexive. 1 John 2.14 is reflective in the sense of being corroborative and explicatory of the two verses preceding it. The author reflects on and slightly extends what he has already substantially expressed. So if there is anything to wring out of the change of the verb tenses, you know, that, that's a proposal. And uh, what I did, because the, the present is more emphatic, Rather than just say, I am writing to you, to show that it's somewhat emphatic, according to verbal aspects theory, I said, the reason I am writing to you, little children, and I also think, you know, it, this, this conveys more emotion and urgency. Hey, the reason, I'm, I'm writing for a reason here, is because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Yeah, I tried to get fancy there. I'm writing to you, fathers, because... You know him who was from the beginning. And I'm writing to you, young men, because you have conquered the evil one. The reason I've written to you, little ones, is because you know the Father. To you, fathers, I have written because you know him who was from the beginning. And to you, young men, I have written because you are strong. And blah, 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 blah. So, may not be right, but th th there's a case to be made for some significance in the shift in verb tenses. Yes. Why he chooses to use paideia instead of technia between verses 12 and 14, where the others stay the same? Is there any thoughts on that? Um, I would explain it by the superfluity of his affection. You know, I have uh, pet names for my German shepherd who is wasting away in my absence. He hates it when I'm gone. Uh, I have pet names for my children, even though they're grown men. I have pet names for my wife. And I don't always just call them by one pet name. You know, I like to change it up. Just because, I mean, what are pet names for, you know? So, these are, un some of John's terms, you know, techna is normal. Technia is an unusual word. He's already using unusual words, but he just switches it up. Because I, I, uh, I think these people are dear to him, and I think rhetorically he can express that by using a richness, a wealth, you know, of terms of endearment. That's just a theory. I don't know. Who's doing the last verse in this set? Fifteen. One more thing. You know, God created the world, right? Correct. Can we say God's creative? Yes. Can we say God's love? So what should love be? Creative. And if you're writing, you're writing creatively, you're, you know, you're going you're gonna to strive for effect, for the, for the richness of the effect of uh, you know, recognizing the individuality of these people and saying things to them that are going to resonate and, and confirm how you feel about them. So he, you know, he's just giving rhetorical confirmation to to what he teaches about, about God and about uh, what he said at the very beginning. I'm writing these things so that your joy may be made full. All right. 11, 5, 1, 2, 11, 1, 9, 1, 2, 11, 3, 2, 1, 2, 11, 5, one, two, one, two, nine. You don't believe in alto? I left off alto. <laughs> um, that's three. Okay. And as far as your 
right above your three there, you've got that prepositional phrase, en to cosmo, yes. which is the object of the article ta. Right. That prepositional phrase, again, at, in com combination with the article, is functioning as a noun. The in the world things. You could do a squiggly and put a two above it, okay. because it, the sometimes prepositional phrases. You know, you can make a noun out of anything in Greek. Just put an article in front of it. <laughs> you can make a noun out of an adverb. Like set your minds on the things above, ta, ano, the, above. <laughs> you know, it. it so you, that, that's uh, how you handle it. Any other number suggestions? Yes? My, uh, I was looking at that agapa. Uh, where am I? Uh, yeah. Uh, That's kind of obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Ah. It seems so clear in our bedroom. And then we get to, uh, you. if you work in your bedroom or your study, wherever you work. Couple more hands. I'm just curious: Is the may and the oof are those uh, the two elevens on the left-hand side? Are those particles or are they adverbs? Well, I would call the may an eight, but he is, and the ook an eight. But some grammars call them particles, and so we can. It's a free country. You can call them eight or eleven. All right. Right. And is the may day? Uh, is that an 11, or would that be like a conjunction? Some people are going to call it 10s, and some people are going to call it 11s. All right. I'd call it a 10, but I'm happy with an 11. I'm not happy with a 7 or a 2 or, you know, an 8. But 10 or 11, yeah, Mayday is a little bit of a, a hybrid word. So you can call it a particle. If you can call May a particle, you can call Mayday a particle. Okay, cross-reference. Yeah, one more. Would you say the same about the yang? Yeah, I call a on an eight. Excuse me, a ten. I call it a conjunction. I call if a conjunction, because it, it is a conjunction in English. But this is Greek, and again, some grammars are going to call that a particle. Yeah, dial it down just a little. Good. Cross-reference analysis, James 4.4. 4. This James passage has a slightly different take on the same theme of these verses. Rather than talking about the love of the world, he calls it friendship with the world. And this illustrative language helps to draw out the affections and familiarity that John also prohibits. Commentary interaction. Stott says, uh, love is not an uncontrollable emotion, but the steady devotion of the will. Therefore, it can be commanded to begin or to end. Okay, but well, just pause there because number one, because your period's in the wrong place, right? Yes. No, but number two, uh, I mean, for those of you who are students, uh, I want to re remind you of that book I mentioned this morning by Matthew Elliott called "Faithful Feelings." You know, it was published in Germany. It's been published in North America. Whether it's going to make any headway, I don't know, but I think you, as pastoral leaders, uh, I love Stott. I love his writings. He's a better man than I ever will be, or was, certainly is now. <laughs> and I like it that he put uncontrollable. But it's really easy, even in that sense, to get the idea there's really no such thing as love. There's just dedication. There's just obedience. There's just ethics. Love's not a feeling. Well, love's not just a feeling, but the point of Eliot's book is part of our imago dei, we are made in God's image, and God in the Bible is portrayed as somebody who feels. And Jesus certainly had an emotional life. B.B. <laughs> Warfield wrote a famous essay called The Emotional Life of Our Lord. 
And we can't live right unto God without feeling something. And this was, Matthew Elliott was a student of mine years ago. He grew up in evangelicalism in Wheaton. And I think one of his frustrations as a young, you know, alive, energetic man was going to conservative evangelical churches and basically being told that joy and love and, and all the emotional, interesting words, they just really amounted to will and duty. <laughs> and so he did his doctoral dissertation on emotions in the New Testament. And, uh, you know, his argument is, is that we've been preached to wrongly about this for generations. It's right. I mean, that's one reason, number one, there was a charismatic movement. And number two, there was a contemporary worship movement. Because people got so tired of going to church and never being allowed to feel anything. You know, unless it was something that 80-year-old people feel when they sing the same hymn over again to the same dirge tempo, you know, on a, on a crummy-sounding organ. I mean, people wanted something that they could feel in worship. Now, you can go too far with that. But you can also take away the most, I mean, I love doctrine. And, and uh, you don't get anything done without doing the will of the Lord. And you know, I'm a, I'm a do person. I'm a get up early and grade your papers person. You know? So I, I believe in the redemptive value of, of work. But I am so grateful for a God who, who, who delights and who calls us to rejoice, and uh, for whom love is a feeling. I think God wants to share a feeling with us, and I think he wants to generate in us something that, uh, is it dopamine that they talk about? You know, that there are certain things that they produce dopamine. I think our relationship to God should be so real that it is capable of producing dopamine. There's a chemi we have a chemical reaction to God. You know, because our senses have been trained through the practice of good and evil, as it says at the end of Hebrews 5, that God incarnates himself, you know, in our nerve endings and in our hormones. We, we have a physical, a physically oriented response to God. Are any, med any medical people who want to speak to this? Am I like insane? Yes. You know, part of the challenge, though, is <clears throat> how we as a modern society have defined emotions as opposed to how they're presented both in Genesis and the creation of man and the Imago Dei all the way through. And I think that's where a lot of the confusion happens is that emotions are defined in our society or understood in a very reductionistic one or two dimensional way. And so we've compartmentalized them and divorced them from the entirety of the spirit and the being that God made us in his image. So I, I hear what you're saying, and yet the, the danger to a certain extent that concerns me is when people hear us talking about feelings, they're reducing it to the dopamine rush. And, and how do we link and make sure that we're presenting the whole image of God where the dopamine rush is connected with doctrine and truth and life. Do you, do you think it's uh, do you think it's possible? I, I think. Or you think we should just be safe and not risk the excesses? I think it's scientifically verified for what that's worth. Not that being scientifically verified is really worth a whole lot, but it, it is scientifically verified. But you're training for ministry, right? Yes. Are, are you currently in ministry? Uh, yes. Would you be happy trying to encourage people to understand love of God in such a way that it, it might be connected with a dopamine rush? I'm comfortable with that, as long as they get the whole picture and not just part. Okay. Okay, I have a doctor on my side, so I'm right. <laughs> no, I, it is a very complex issue. Yeah. And it, it is, you know, we, we don't want emotions to, you know, run off the rails. But especially kids, I mean, I, I, I learned so much from my kids and you know, reading the Bible with my kids and watching them internalize it. 
and then singing with them and praying with them. And I mean, you know, little boys, I just had two little boys. Uh, you know, they're such e they're emotional little creatures. You know, they have very strong feelings and impulses. And if you can harness that, you know, and if, you, if, they can, if their imagination and their energy can be captured by a sense of following the Lord, that's really, really powerful. But it can drop off. It can drop off. So by the time you get to adults, everything else you do in life, you do it with your whole everything. You know, you go to football games, and you know, you you uh, you, you name what you do. Your even your occupation is very physical. But church is you go and you sit in rows and you're passive and you stand up and you sit down. And maybe if there's really a rock out Sunday, then with lots of good contemporary music, then maybe you go back and forth like this. But <laughs> you know, it's a very emotionless, it's an emotionless se segment of your life. And I don't, I don't think that can be, can be real healthy. Okay, yeah. Um, when trying to counsel people in the church, uh, you teach a holistic view of emotion and, uh, and obedience, and then you get folks, so, so you say it's heart, it's mind, it's will, it's all of us, and then you have folks that um, are maybe in sin, um, disobedient, and they say, I want to obey, I want to do that, I want to repent, I just, I just don't feel it, and I don't want to be disingenuous by just doing it. So I'm waiting for the emotion, and they're waiting years um, before they actually repent, or, um, and then I think that that reaction, and you're sitting across the table from, from somebody who's saying, well, I'm waiting for the emotion, it's not there, or whatever, and it flips us then to this a position where you go, you just got to do it. You know, the scripture's called you to obey, you just got to do it. Um, I guess, how would you counsel somebody in that? Well, that, that's where this, you got, you, got three, you got three coordinates we're working with here. And when you're on the negative side of any of those three considerations, any one of the other two trumps your negative side. In other words, um, if if you're you said somebody's living in sin, okay, they're they're living in a state of sexual rebellion against God, let's say, and they say I don't feel like doing any. I don't feel like repenting. That's when the ethical side and the ethical side steps in and says, on the Z coordinate, I'm just you know yeah. on the Z coordinate. You're in darkness. The Y coordinate says repent. And if you don't trust God enough to repent, you also aren't anywhere on the uh, X coordinate. And by your own admission, you're not on the Y coordinate. So you are really, really in hot water with God unless something changes. Because apparently you think you're okay and it's just your lack of feel. You can almost blame God for not giving you the feeling that you need to do the right thing. But actually, you're in darkness, darkness, darkness. If there is a God and if, if the Bible is a place where we find out what he thinks. So, you know, I don't know how you would finesse that counsel, but that's where you as a strategist, you see this person has nowhere to hide. This person has nowhere to hide because there's no integrity. There's no integrity to that kind of reasoning that waits for a feeling when there is a very clear ethical violation and a very clear betrayal of trust in God. If God says don't commit adultery and you're committing adultery, and you say, well, I'm waiting a feel for a feeling to admit that I've got a problem, you need to be a lot more honest with yourself. And with you know, with the church and with the Bible, with with your whole self understanding. And then if you would, maybe you'd find the courage to say no to yourself and follow Christ. Because it's basically a failure of nerve. You know, you, you you don't have the nerve to get out of this relationship because you know it's gonna hurt. And there's a lot of other things you could say too, depending on the person. And sometimes they need to hear it. I mean, sometimes people need kid gloves, but sometimes people really this is where we get back to father figure. You know, sometimes people need somebody that has political capital because you, you, you've invested yourself in a congregation, you've invested yourself in families. They can't possibly say you hate us or you don't care for us. And you just have to get nose to nose and tell them the things that you don't want to say and they don't want to hear, but it's got to be done. And maybe you had, I, I pray you had a dad that did that. 
and those were maybe some of the best things that ever were done for you. You, know, you just got laid bare. <laughs> and it was the best thing that ever happened. And that's, that's something, I mean, I'm going to sound sexist, I don't, and maybe I am, but I, mean, I think on paper, m men are going to be better than that. They're going to be better at that than, than a lot of women are going to be. Now, women may be better with a lot of women, but this is where men's ability to cauterize their emotions sometimes uh, is useful. <laughs> Because sometimes people have to hear things, and you, you know you know you don't want to say it, and they don't want to hear it, but you got to get your ducks in a row, and, and, and it's, you know you got to got to lay it out, and people need that. Yeah. Just one comment: the psalmist goes right back from Moses right through to about 400 BC. I think God uses the psalms in so many genres to present so many sides of Himself, not just theologically, but also. Uh, and more as well. So it gives us a balance. So, I mean, and there is a lot of emotion there, right? There is one, yeah. But there's also a lot of Torah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many authors in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. It gives us the balance. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I uh, created a, a concept of a few years ago working with people like that sex addicts, alcoholics, drug addicts temporary pleasure for long-term sadness. I said, why do you want to create this temporary pleasure and then in the long run, you just become sad and sometimes this is just eternal sadness. You know, why, why do you want to engage in that kind of stuff? You know, sometimes it really gets fun. Yeah. So I'm going to raise that question sometimes. Go ahead. All right, Lou. It says, even though the author just gave his readers confidence and certainty regarding their position with God, he does not intend to encourage complacency, and thus takes this next section of his epistle to give a warning to them as well. He prohibits them from loving the world. This world that the author speaks of does not refer necessarily to enjoyments or luxuries of physical life, but refers to the sphere that is under the sway of the evil one and stands as an antithesis to God. Uh, she also says, uh, the love of the world is probably an objective genitive. And Do you mean the love of the world or the love of the Father? Love of the Father. So okay. Love of the Father is an objective genitive and is most likely to be intended in parallel to loving the world. This anticipates the opposition in the next verse between what belongs to the Father and what belongs to the world. Final translation is, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Grounded insight. Because God here commands our love to not go towards the world, we must endeavor to steer our love in the right direction. Our love will not go in the right direction naturally. The command also reminds us that our hearts can easily be tempted towards the world. Okay. Any comment or question on Micah's verse? Yes. Within um, a John context, how would you define love? Or let me say, is it fair to consider love as an attribute of God? Communicable attribute of God. Yeah. That's consistent. Yeah. And I, I mean, you, you may have looked, I, I write a lot about this too, right. and especially in relation to how different translations take it. But, um, and I probably still translate love, but, but I might say set, set our affections on. And so much depends here on your implicit theological anthropology. You know, what, what, what is a human being? You know, are they a rational animal? Are, are, are they uh, uh, an ethical machine? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with uh, Jonathan Edwards and, and Augustine. And the, the pastor, of course, in our time who's done the most along this vein would be John Piper. Uh, who brings out the affective dimension of humanity and that we are created for worship. We are created to delight in God. Unfortunately, sin makes that impossible. But redemption is a process of the soul being freed to delight in the Lord. And that's where you know you got the term Christian hedonism, which can go in the wrong direction. But there is a sphere and there are things in the world 
that draw, they, they, they tempt us to vest in them what is properly vested only in God. And if we're vested properly in God, there's, there's a sanctification, I think, of our beings that permits us lawful pleasures in the world. And if we're not vested in God, it doesn't matter how much we demonize and hate the world, there's no, vir no virtue in that in God's eyes. And you know, that's the trap of world abnegation as a means of salvation. You, know, you prove that you're close to God because you don't watch television and you know, you're an ascetic. You don't know who's playing football. You just pride yourself. I don't. I don't have. I don't know anything to do with the world. I'm not worldly. You're worldly. You know, because you watched the football game last night. I think um, by some standards, Christians can be very worldly if they're coming to the world by means of an even stronger affection for God. And then there is freedom in the Lord to delight in the good things. You know, in the I think it's First Timothy where Paul talks about people that forbid marriage and uh, teach the abstention from foods. Or in Romans 14, you know, people who were uh, teetotalers to, to their detriment. Say, look, it's fine if you don't want to drink wine, but don't load that on somebody else. So there are ways that people, they, they try to make points by denigrating the things in the world. And that's not what he's talking about. He's, say, he's saying you have, uh, you owe God your love. You know, that's what we need to be doing. Vest our love in God. And then uh, the rest of these things take care of themselves.